Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second part of our whole new DVD series, which is called The Secrets of the Illuminati. We are at part two of this DVD series, and it's called America's Occult Holidays. Now, we know, according to the scriptures, in Genesis chapter 1, verse four, 14, it says, And God said, Let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So the calendar had been established so that man could indeed measure the seasons, grow crops, and live a good life. However, ever since the infiltration of the Illuminati into Europe, into America, and throughout the rest of the world, things became twisted and perverted according to their occult religion, which is known as Luciferian witchcraft. Now, in um, the first part of this DVD series, which was called The Revival of the Antichrist, we had shown that there was a numerical pattern that the Illuminati had operated by and through which they created the two great seals of the United States of America. Now, using a similar pattern, and they will use these patterns that can be tracked once you know what they are, they twisted and perverted the calendar to fit into their belief systems. And this is what we're going to start off with. And throughout the rest of this um, DVD, once we go throughout that, we're going to examine just how bad their infiltration into not just American society, but throughout the rest of the world through holidays. And even by its own definition, holidays is nothing but holy days. But we will get back to that. For now, let's begin with the um, major Sabbaths. Now, as I said before, the Illuminati, they observe eight major nights in which they perform human sacrifice. The eight nights of human sacrifice are December 21st, which is the night of Yule, February 1st, Imbolg, March 21st, Astara, May 1st, the night of Beltane, which is the second highest night of human sacrifice on the Illuminati calendar, June 21st, Litha, August 1st, Lunasad, September 21st, Mabin, and from October 29th through the 31st are the nights of Samhain, or what some people refer to as Halloween. This is the number one, the highest night of human sacrifice on the Illuminati's calendar. Now, there are four major seasonal markers that all people go by, especially those who are farmers. Those four nights, which um, the first one would um, fall on December 21st, which is the winter solstice, March 21st, which is the spring equinox, June 21st, which is the summer solstice, and September 21st, which is the autumnal equinox. Now, when we take a look at how the eight nights of human sacrifice had been arranged on our calendar, you're going to find something very, very interesting. The winter solstice is on December 21st. Now from that date all the way to February 1st, which is a human night sacrifice of Bimbo, there was a period of six weeks in between. Now from February 1st to March 21st, there was a seven week period. And this repeats itself all the way through the calendar. It goes six, seven, six, seven, six, seven, six, seven, all the way through the calendar. Now this is very significant because if you remember, when we had studied parts of uh, numerology and dramatria in the Arrival of the Antichrist DVD, we found out that the number six is a number for man, seven is a number for God. In essence, what they are doing here in their occult holidays, they are placing man above God. And this gets even more in-depth because when we take a look at it once more, we find out that 6 and 7 is 13. We have another 13, 13, 13, 13 pattern running throughout the entire calendar. 
And these 13s, these multiples of 13s, if you recall, were found also on the back of the um, $1 bill on the two great seals of the Illuminati, which we proved were not the United States, but they, they are in fact belong to the Illuminati. So you can see already just through their numerical pattern and how they perverted the original tension of God into eight nights of human sacrifice and that numerically it all adds up perfectly. Now, going throughout the calendar we can find out and add other things to um, the calendar. Similar um, days that we observe. One would be um, Christmas, which is, right, uh, which is um, traditionally held on December 25th. Then we have, of course, Groundhog's Day. And then, of course, is May Day. These three fall exactly on those nights of human sacrifice. And, of course, last but not least, Halloween. But other days had been added. The Illuminati's intention was to truly pervert our calendar and to place their sacred days on it. But they guised them. Take a look over here, ladies and gentlemen, very carefully. You'll find out that among the other days that have been added, we now have Inauguration Day, which is on January 20th. Now, interesting enough, Inauguration Day, which um, we have the new president take his oath of office, that was originally held in November. This was purposely brought up to January 20th so that it could fit in with this numerical pattern. Valentine's Day is on February 14th. That's been added. <coughs> a, um, April Fool's Day, which is on April 1st. Um, over here, and we'll get back to this, was the uh, 1996 Olympics game. Then, of course, we have, among other things, now on July 4th was Independence Day. And then on um, the night of Mabin, we have the end of the 2000 Olympic Games. Now, what is so significant about the placement of those particular days? The reason they were placed in their particular position was so that they would fit in with this 6, 7, 13 pattern. And we're going to go over that right now. You'll note that Inauguration Day, which is on January 20th, is exactly 13 days before the human night sacrifice of Imbolg. Valentine's Day, which is on February 14th, is exactly 13 days after the human night sacrifice of Imbolg. We'll get back to East in a bit. April 1st, or All Fool's Day, is exactly 13 weeks from the beginning of the calendar. Over here, let's see, Independence Day is exactly 13 days after the human night sacrifice of Litha. Now, with the um, 1999 Olympic Games, which was on July 19th, 1996, that was uh, exactly 13 days before the human night sacrifice of Lunasad. And, if you notice, the end of the 2000 um, Olympic game ended on Mabin, or I should say, the, um, on the human night sacrifice of Mabin. And of course, Halloween is exactly on the human night sacrifice, the highest and holiest of all days for the Illuminati, October 31st. Now, let's get back to Easter for a second. Now, Easter is a very interesting day. <coughs> you see, Supposedly, and I do say supposedly, Easter is supposed to be when Christ resurrected um, from the dead and after he, after he um, paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. Now, in order to measure this, this is how the Catholic Church, and this is the Catholic Church now, 
This is how the Catholic Church came up with um, trying to figure out the day of Easter. Because if you notice, it's always changing. It's not a fixed day. And the reason is because what they will do, they will turn to the human night sacrifice of Astara, which is May, uh, March 21st. Now, the next thing they will do, they will wait for the next full moon after March 21st. Whenever the first um, full moon is after that, the first Sunday after that full moon is when Christ was supposed to have resurrected. So in other words, they are using a forbidden occult practice known as astrology to determine when Christ had resurrected from the grave. This is their explanation from it. And if you don't believe me, ladies and gentlemen, you just go to your calendar, you know, um, next time around, see when the next uh, full moon is after March 21st, and I guarantee you the Sunday after that is going to be when Christ supposedly res resurrected. But that's how they determined it. I did not. Now, something funny has been going on with the Olympic Games ever since we celebrated um, 100 years of the modern day Olympic Games because it started back in the modern days in 1896. And in 1996, something changed. The Olympic Bowl no longer was a bowl. Take a look, ladies and gentlemen. At the top of that scaffolding is what the newspapers, and this is what the newspapers reported, they called this the Olympic Cauldron. Now I want you to take a good look at this because you notice it is, first of all, a red cauldron because it refers back to the red shield of the House of Rothschilds and it had 18 jet flames, which is six plus six plus six, and it is properly referred to as a cauldron. This is what the newspapers called it. This is how they referred to it. And this is one of the newspapers from that um, time, 1996. I want you to take a look very carefully, ladies and gentlemen, because off in the distance is that Olympic cauldron. This is what was now lighting the, the night skies in Atlanta. It's no longer an Olympic bowl, it is a cauldron. But it didn't end there. You see, in the 2000 Olympics, well, I should say, um, in the 1996 one, we had something else that was going on. At the opening of the games, this might be a little hard to see, because it's black and white, but these gold creatures were being summoned up to bless the Olympic games. Those gold um, creatures are actually the spirits of the Olympic Games, and they are referred to as Nikes. Now, when we get back to what else was going on, it gets very, very interesting. Now, going and taking a look at the official logo of a 1996 game, you will notice that there are three stars here and a crescent moon. If you recall, in the first DVD of this series, which was called America, um, um, The Arrival of the Antichrist, the most ancient symbol for Semiramis was a crescent moon and the most ancient sim um, symbol for her son was Nimrod. Here we have the star and the crescent moon of Nimrod and Semiramis. And what's even more interesting is a master witch or a third level witch will have three stars and a crescent moon as their, um, as their insignia because it denotes their rank in the occult world. In the 2000 Olympic game, we have now Semiramis holding the laurel wreath, and it is Semiramis, the goddess herself, and what's even more interesting is that since the Olympic Games um, are Greek in origins, I ask you this, why are there four Roman 
um, horsemen and, um, um, and horses here. These are actually the four horsemen of the apocalypse as far as I've determined. These have absolutely nothing to do with this Greek goddess. However, they were purposely placed there anyways. But it gets even more interesting because at the opening of the 2004 Olympic Games, we have these um, ladies dressed in virginal white, and this is what was reported now, opening up with a pagan ceremony to welcome in the spirit of, the spirit, I should say, of the Olympic Games, which we've already identified to as Nikes. But here we now have the ancient pagan ceremonies being performed. And here is, of course, one of the coins that was um, printed for, this, um, for the Olympic Games. And here we have that spirit, again, one of the Nikes. Now, when we get to the 2008 Games, um, the Beijing Games, it gets very, very interesting. Things have changed drastically because take a good look at this Olympic torch. Rather bizarre, if you ask me, it doesn't even really remind me much of a torch, hardly, because of the top. You know, something seems to be missing. But when you look at the spires right here, the way they spiral, those are all sixes. Take a good look at those, ladies and gentlemen. If we were just to turn it, and I'm going to turn it like this, upside down, to make it easier for you. Notice they are all become sixes. Literally speaking, the torch of the Olympic game, the 2008 Beijing game, was completely covered in sixes. And you can see it very clearly here also. And one of those Olympiads who carried the torch can be seen carrying, right here, the torch, all those sixes. And what's even more interesting, when we take a look at the Olympic cauldron, that time around, you will note, ringed all around it, are those same sixes. Those are nothing but sixes that completely go around the Olympic cauldron. Now, these represent the various logos, different colored um, logos, for the 2012 Olympic Games that's going to be held in London. Now, I have to tell you, um, for all the logos I've ever seen in the Olympic Games, these are certainly among the most bizarre. I mean, I can barely make out that they are supposed to be 2012. Now, when we look at the larger version of one of them, you know, it's supposed to be 201 and whatever this centerpiece is supposed to be here. Who knows what that's supposed to be? Unless we take another look at this. Remember, this is supposed to be the 2012 um, logo for the Olympic um, Games in London. When we take a look and break this down, it becomes a Z, an I, and there's that centerpiece, an O, and an N. It actually spells out the word Zion. Now, I'm not talking about those people who um, are into moving, uh, into giving Jerusalem its own permanent homeland free from terror and everything, that type of Zionism, no. We are talking about those people, the Illuminati, who have been trying to create a Zionist conspiracy. And by that, they are not 
um, Jewish by practice. True Jewish people wouldn't be involved in any of this. The Illuminati, their center of power in Europe, one of their major places is in London. And it's in a square mile of England known as the city. I know, I, I'm from, you know, um, England. Well, anyways, it is the bankers, the ones who's actually um, pulled off this whole event to get the Olympic Games brought to London in um, the year 2012. But it is also the bankers who's trying to take control of everything through the central banks that they've established, through their religion and through their politics. And their politics involve the belief of Zionism. That's why it's been designed like this. Now, as much as they have perverted the calendar and the original intention and the pattern of it, a lot more has happened. We are now going to take a look into their um, Sabbaths, which they've disguised and we've embraced as Christian holidays. We're going to take a look at each and every single one carefully, and then, quite honestly, you're going to be responsible to God for all the information and the knowledge that you've just learned. I only hope that you do the right thing by it. We are now going to examine the wonderful holiday known as Christmas. Now what could be possibly wrong with having the spirit of goodwill towards men and all this. Well, if you understand the truth behind the Christmas story, you're going to find out that the whole thing is wrong. When I was a child, I remember when my father used to take us out to the woods and we would take an axe, we would find a nice full pine tree and we would cut it down, we would drag it through the snow, we would bring it in the house, much to my mother's protest, because there'd be pine needles and snow everywhere. And then we would set it up on one of those metal stands so that it wouldn't move, you know, we made sure it was really good and solid, and we would um, deck it with gold and silver trimmings and everything. And of course, you know, put the traditional five-pointed sow on top of it. And this is what most people, if they're from my generation, and most people nowadays, um, would have gone through that. I'm not saying that you will go out and cut down a tree. No, most, a lot of people like going for the artificial stuff. So what could possibly be wrong with a Christmas tree? Is there anything unbiblical or ungodly about it? Well, According to the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 10, we pick it up in verse 1. It says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, and folks, I want you to memorize these next seven words. Learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. Now listen very carefully to this one, the middle of verse 3. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a Christmas tree. And right here, in God's own word, he says, learn not the way of the heathen. When the heathen are the ancient occultists, they're also known as pagans. You are not supposed to be practicing any of this. God's own word makes it very clear not to be involved in this. And yet, there are going to be those people who's going to try to convince you, well, God's not talking about a tree here. He was referring to a plant or to something else. I've heard these arguments over and over and over again, ladies and gentlemen, and quite honestly, at this age, I'm sick of it. Because God's word makes it very clear. These people have gone out, they've cut down a tree, they brought it home, they fastened it so it didn't move, they put all types of gold and silver decorations on it, they decked the halls with it, and this is exactly what we're doing to this very day. 
So don't tell me that this is something other than a tree because this is exactly what those pagans were doing then and that's exactly what we're doing now. And when we take a look just at one of these pictures, this is exactly what the Bible had been talking about. People had been trimming it and decking it with gold and silver and all these wonderful, beautiful items that I wanted. The um, pagans, among other things, they would um, put little um, pieces of cake, candy, and sweet items on it. This is why to this very day we're putting um, candy canes and other things like that on it because it's part of the ancient pagan practice of honoring the winter stag god. Now, as I just stated, Jeremiah makes it very, very clear that Christmas trees are not supposed to be observed. They have absolutely nothing to do with anything that is good or godly. So then the question is, why are we doing it? On top of the Christmas tree, and just about most Christmas trees, you will find that there is a five-pointed star. Now the question is, why do we have, you know, such an item on top of our trees? If you recall, well, there's many different candies, little cakes and offerings and such here. All this is here because it goes all the way back to Nimrod. Nimrod himself, as depicted here, this is one of the ancient depictations on a relief of Nimrod. Nimrod himself, if you remember, was the stag god. He was considered the winter god. And just like at um, Rockefeller Center, where they have these huge Christmas trees every year all lit up, at the top you'll find the traditional five-pointed star. Now, interesting enough, at the base, in front of Rockefeller Center, whose address is 666, mind you, and it's no accident because if you've ever gone to that building, and I've seen it and been there before, the very top, these huge neon lights, there were three red sixes that will glow at night. But at the base of this um, tree, is a statue, and that remains there all year. And let me show you a larger version of this. That statue is um, the statue of Prometheus. Now, Prometheus, if you know your ancient um, Greek legends, was the one who stole the fire of illumination from the gods and brought it down to mankind. So mankind now had um, illumination or, or the enlightenment of wisdom. He stole the fire from the gods. So, why are there, among other things, Christmas lights on the tree? Well, you see, there's a lot of history behind this. You see, in the old days, um, people from the old world, like me and others, um, and from the ancient days, and the people who are practicing the occult to this very day, candles would be put on top of the trees, among other things, because it was the dark times. You know, this was a season of the year in which the, um, most of the sun was gone and it was constantly dark out. Well, candles were lit that was actually used as a beacon to the winter god so that during the evenings he would see those lights fly over and come around your house and bless the people inside of the house in your home for welcoming him back in. This is why the candles were used, and to this very day, we're still using these seasonal lights. Well, you know, we've got electric lights, so we've modernized the practice of welcoming back the stag god. We put them around the tree, we'll put them in the windows, and we have these massive displays outside, in which these lights, according to the ancient occult practice now, is supposed to welcome back onto the earth the winter god. Now, part of the practice of Christmas is hanging, it, well, I should say, first of all, is the Yule log fire. Now, this, you know, the log inside of it is referred to as the Yule log. Now, it's not called Yule for no reason at all. Remember, this is December 21st 
the human night sacrifice of Yule. Now, tradition teaches us in the occult, no longer me, because I'm a born again Christian, God be praised, but tradition in the occult teaches that, um, first of all, the Yule log should be made out of birch. Once um, it has been lit and used for um, the holidays, you're supposed to keep one part of the birch log or the yule log and set it aside for next year. Why you do this is because you're supposed to take that piece of the yule log from last year and light this year's yule log. This way, it's a constant cycle. You take from the old, give to the new, the new keeps rekindling um, itself over and over again. This, symbolically speaking, is the cycle of reincarnation because every year you welcome back into your home by lighting the Yule Log, the god of the winter known as the Stag God or originally known as Nimrod. Now, what could possibly be so ungodly about kissing underneath the mistletoe. Well, there's a couple of things wrong with this, first of all. One thing I will warn you about, people, whatever you do, never touch those berries. Three of them could kill you. This plant is so poisonous. Um, among other things that's wrong with it, mistletoe itself was very sacred to the Druids. Um, it was a fertility plant. This was a very sacred plant to the Druids from which the Illuminati claim direct ascendancy from. They claim to be the modern day Druids or the modern day rendition of the Druids. And it's because this is a fertility plant that people kiss underneath it. Now, with the mistletoe, we have another fertility plant known as the wreath. You know, we make a Christmas wreath. It's green and red, and you will find, constantly find green and red throughout the Christmas season because in the occult world, those are the two colors that I use for this season. And for every season, they do have specific colors that's used for their occult magic and occult belief system. Now, the wreath itself is always circular if they're an occult practitioner, and there will always be candles in the center of it. The reason this is so, as I said before, this is another fertility symbol. The candle or candles represent the male phallic symbol. The circle represents the female reprodu reproductive organs. This is why it is, a, um, symbolically speaking, a fertility symbol. And this is something, symbolically speaking, we have a circle here, man of the beats, that represents reincarnation. In other words, the life, the birth, and the death of the stag god <clears throat> every single year. And you will find that this symbol originated from the great obelisk in Egypt. Now here is a picture of the Vatican City. You will notice dead center is the obelisk. This obelisk here, at the very top of it, and that bowl supposedly resides the um, charred remains, um, the cremated ashes of Julius Caesar. But notice dead center is the, Christ well, to the side is the Christmas tree. Now, the obelisk itself, and let me explain this to you. Notice how the obelisk is here and there's a circle around it. This is a very ancient occult pagan symbol of fertility. Now, you will notice that there are sets of lines, two here, two here, and all the way around. Now, the reason the obelisk was designed in such a fashion was because it's really, in actuality, a giant heliocentric sundial. The shadow of this obelisk, and all obelisks wherever they are throughout the world, is going to fall in a certain place depending on the position of the sun. Now, if the obelisk shadow falls within any of these two lines, it is another night of human sacrifice. That's why there is eight sets of them, because the shadow will fall 
in between these sets throughout the year. And of course, as I said before, notice, you know, the um, Vatican Church is going to make sure they have their pagan Christmas tree right here in, um, in St. Peter's um, Square. And other examples of the obelisk we have here is one in um, Central Park in, um, in New York. This would be Cleopatra's Needle. Supposedly, this is one of the three um, needles that resided in Heliopolis when um, they were um, just dragged from Egypt and brought here to America. This one here. Well, we've already gone over this one in the first DVD. This particular one was man-made, just like the others, but this one was made here in Washington, D.C. This is, of course, the Washington Monument. 555 feet above ground, 111 feet below ground, making for the total height of this occult pagan symbol 666 feet exactly. And if you notice, like the other ones, here we have the male um, phallic symbol and there is a circle all the way around it, which represents the female reproductive organs. This is nothing but the ancient occult fertility symbol of Semiramis and Nimrod just brought to the modern day through the, orga through the organization of the Illuminati. Now, of course, we have another fertility, another fertility symbol here. This one is the holly. These are holly berries. And again, this is um, another sacred plant in the Illuminati. They still worship this as one of the more sacred plants. It's another fertility symbol. As I said before, these are the holly berries. And, of course, there is, from the old country, the person known as the holly king. Okay? It's from the holly king, the whole stories behind the holly king and such, where eventually another person comes into play. From the holly king you get who's known as Santa Claus. Now, Santa Claus is an interesting study because, you know, through Santa Claus, the Illuminati has tried to prove that they are like gods on the earth, through the myth. Now, when we go through the story of Santa Claus, Santa Claus is actually supposed to be all-knowing. I mean, think about this. Doesn't Santa Claus know who's been good and who's been nice every single day of the year? That's one of Santa Claus's ability. He, he knows exactly who's been good and who's been nice, and he knows um, how this has worked for each, of in, each individual throughout the year. Well, Santa Claus has the ability of being omnipresent or just about, because on the night of Christmas, is he not able to traverse the entire world and literally just about be everywhere at the same time and drop off who knows how many billions of presents? Well, at least that's what the story tells us. And Santa Claus his sleigh, if you notice, is pulled by eight reindeers. Now, these are um, commonly known as stags. This is why, if you notice very quickly, people, Santa Claus is just another representation of the stag god. And it's for eight reindeers, eight for no reason at all. You see, eight is the only number that if you put it on its side, becomes an occult symbol, which is the number for infinity, or the act of reincarnation throughout the year, in this case, Santa Claus. Now, here we have one of the ancient depictations of the stag god. It's one of the few um, bronze reliefs that we still have. You notice he has the horns as a stag, and um, he has this bracelet here and other things that denote him as the stag god. 
Santa's little helpers, and this is what really kills me, you know, rather than own up to the truth, what we've done here in America, well, we've given them a cute little look, you know. Well, these are just little helpers dressed in green and red, and they help Santa throughout the year, you know, making toys and what me not. But you see, the traditions of most of, of America, of most of the holidays, come from Europe. And the true um, elves uh, um, of Christmas were very horrible, evil little creatures. They went around and caused mischief for everyone or anyone who came across them. And the problem is, um, these elves have now, um, ever since the 40s and up to this day because of J.R.R. Tolkien, have now, be called, have now become tall, slender, beautiful looking beings with great power and all this. They've been transformed um, as a result of that. But the truth of the matter is, the ancient um, traditions and pictures do not lie. They point out to us that the traditional elves were nothing but small, demonic, imp-like creatures who caused anyone trouble who came across their paths. And there's a, a very interesting elf um, that you'll find in Scotland. It's, um, it's, it's around Argyll. This is a giant wooden elf. And if you notice, it is anything but a cutesy little, warm, fuzzy little creature. This is a horrible, evil-looking creature. And that's what they were all about. Elves, you know, only became, you know, cutesy once we decided to try to dress up the occult practice of Yule and call it Christmas and make it something palatable. And as I stated before, well, of course, over the Christmas fire, you know, the Yule time, the Yule log fire, well, we hand Christmas stockings. Stockings have, you know, according to the ancient um, practices, is where presents were left, not for the person to get, but they were supposed to leave presents there for the Yule God, for the stag God to take. But we perversed it, and supposedly now, those are there for our benefits. People will put small gifts and items in them, and if Santa Claus determines you're bad, you'd get, you know, charcoal put in them instead, you know? Now, all this is where from the occult world, the modern day practice of Christmas has come from. But the question that we need to ask is, is this the birthday of Christ? Was Christ born on December 25th? And if not, whose birthday is it? Now, when we turn to the book of Luke, we're going to get a major clue as to what um, as to whether or not Christ was born on the 25th um, of December, let alone during the season. According to Luke chapter 2, in, it goes from verse 1 to verse 5, it says, And it came to pass in those days that w there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made from Cyrenius, was governor, was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Okay? So, we have a biblical marker right there. There was, historically speaking, and we can prove this, um, a, um, a taxation from Caesar Augustus. Now, according to the ancient records, this um, taxation happened during the month of September. Now, let's just keep that in mind as we go along. Um, picking it up, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, and this is very important, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, 
little shepherds out in the field right now, and they're watching over the flock. I have spoken to many Jewish friends of mine and to rabbis I've known about this passage. My friends who have lived on kibbutzes have told me that the sheep that shepherds watch over in the, over in the fields around that part of Judea and such, um, the sheep are never brought out of the field until the end of September or, and they say, usually no later than the second week of October because it gets too cold out there for the sheep to, um, to survive in. So it's around that time of the year that they will bring the, she the sheep in. And the rabbis have told me the sim a similar story. They all say right around that same time. So, two things we can conclude so far, safely as far as I can see it. The, the timing of the taxation, and according to people who live there in Judea to this very day and in the past, who have spoken to me and who have been eyewitnesses, says that's the time of the year when they bring the sheep in. It's not after October or, you know, the middle. It's not after that. It's before it, and usually that is somewhere around the end of September or around the beginning to the mid part of October. So we know that that's when the timing of the shepherds had to have been, right around that time. Now, we find out another interesting thing in the Bible. We have to pick this up, going back to Matthew, Chapter 2, and we started in verse 1. And this is going to be a bit of a length, lengthy one, but just bear with me. This has a lot of important information for us. Now when, Jesus, now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may also come and worship him. When they had heard uh, the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. We'll just stop it there. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary. Guess what? They did not find him in the manger. You know, according to ridiculous traditional beliefs, Christ was um, visited by everyone in the manger. Now this, um, a friend of mine took this photo for me, Lynn Shalesky. This is quite a manger scene. You know, we have um, three wise men. Now, according to Catholic teaching, that's Gaspar, Belthia, Belth Belthazar, and Melchior. Um, we have an angel there. Uh, we have a shepherd there. Camels. We have a donkey and a couple of sheep. And most of those people weren't there. You see, the Bible tells us that when Christ was born, Mary and Joseph was put out in the manger because there was no room for them in the stalls. And according to what we just read right now, it says about the wise men, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. You see, they never made it to the manger. They never did. You see, this is 
two years later after Christ was born. Going to the Bible, it makes it very, very clear that first of all, these wise men, when Christ was being born, they saw the great star of the east. They weren't there in Judea when they saw it. These people are from the far east. They had to literally cross from one end of the continent all the way across and then down into the land of Judea to where they could finally make it. And this took approximately two years, ladies and gentlemen, because they didn't have automobiles or rain planes or trains. They took camels. And they formed a giant caravan. And this caravan literally had to have been humongous because you see, in, that, in those days and age, um, um, Judea and the outer provinces was not the place to visit because um, they had a lot of sordid people there. It was just not a user-friendly place, to put it politely. So the wise men, and it was more than three, because they had to pull their resources together, first of all, and get permission from whatever um, potentate they, um, um, they were under authority, and they had to leave and make that two-year crossing with a huge army by their side so that they would be protected. Now, they would go to the region. They had, remember, golds of gi of, um, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when they got to Christ, it was two years later, and then they presented him with the gifts. And it is two years because if you recall, in, further on in the Bible, it said that Herod was so upset that um, he could not find out from the wise men where the baby Jesus was because he didn't want to worship him. He wanted to murder him. So, once the wise men had told him um, what had happened, he knew that Christ was two years old at this, at this point, which is why he told his soldiers to go out into Jerusalem and kill all the two-year-old um, male children. From two and under, they were all supposed to be butchered. That's why it was two years old, because of the timing. This is what was going on. Christ was two years old at, the, at this time. The wise men had informed Herod how long it took them to get from one end of the continent to where they were now. And so all he had to do from that point was just tell the soldiers, kill all the male children to and under. So the question then becomes, if it wasn't the Lord's birthday, Whose birthday was it? If you recall, back in our first DVD of this series, we found out that Semiramis and Nimrod had a child known as Tammuz. And Tammuz was supposed to be the reincarnation of Nimrod because he had been killed. Now, Tammuz's birthday in, according to the ancient um, records and everything, Tammuz was born on December 25th. Now, according to occult practice, remember, Yule is the night of, de of December 21st. It's the longest um, winter night um, for the year. And it is on um, this day that a night of human sacrifice occurs. What had happened? In order to marry this new movement of Catholicism into um, paganism, they took December 21st, moved it up to December 25th, the birthday of Tammuz. There was also a major Roman festival at that time on December 25th known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a big festival in which, you know, there would be these huge parades of people um, going through the cities and to the heart of Rome. They would be dressed in their finest outfits and they would be bringing offerings and gifts and everything. And there'd be, you know, a lot of wine drinking. Um, there'd be ham and birds being served as um, parts of the banquet. And gifts were actually being given to all the people, and there was a lot of wine and merriment. Well, you know what? The same thing goes on to this very day. 
Aren't we given, you know, these Christmas gift offerings? And aren't we, you know, still having the Christmas ham? And aren't we giving gifts to one another? And don't we still have, you know, these long Christmas parades? You know, I think they're called, um, they're, they're in New York and other places. We have these huge parades. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, Saturnalia is still being practiced to this very day on December 25th, except all we've done is candy coated, we've Christianized it, and we've called it Christmas. You know, when we take a look at this ancient relief, this is whose birthday we're celebrating. This is one of the most ancient and one of the few reliefs we have of the god known as Tammuz. And it really saddens me to think that somehow we've allowed this pagan god to be um, deified and allowed to be um, the god of Christmas. We, instead of um, having absolutely nothing to do with this pagan occult festival, we're actually worshiping the ancient god known as Temuz. I think by now, and I don't think I have to go any further into this, I think it's quite obvious from, just from the biblical perspective alone, that God wants us to have absolutely nothing to do with these occult practices, because they are occult practices. They're nothing that we should be involved in. God said, learn not the way of the heathen. And over in Corinthians, he strictly tells us not to go after the traditions of men. Because that's all these are. We find out from the scriptures, um, only Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, and some animals, made it to the manger. The angels, believe it or not, had already made their proclamation to the shepherds that Christ was born, and then they left. They didn't make it to the manger. Um, the wise men never made it to the manger. It took them two years to finally get to um, where the Lord was. And even the Bible says that they finally found Joseph in his mother's house. We should have absolutely nothing to do with any of these occult holidays. And, yeah, it might appear as if I'm being a stick in the mud here. Because, let's face it, these holidays are alluring. I mean... Come on, we get presents, you know? And, you know, we sometimes get to choose what presents we want, even though we're not supposed to, you know, but... So it's very alluring, because, as I've told people time and time again, there is a beautiful side to evil, and it's a very, very seductive one. It will twist and distort your reasoning and deceive you into believing that these things are indeed Christians but they are not. Scripture warns us that um, the deceit of the enemy is so strong it could even deceive us, the elected children of God. So I'm going to leave it up to you, ladies and gentlemen, because let's face it, you are responsible for this knowledge now. It's between you and God, but I would tell you right now, I would get rid of this occult practice as soon as I could, because the longer you allow it to stay in your life, the harder it is for you to get rid of it. And all I can say is right now, um, just think about all the evidence, review it in the Bible, and judge for yourself. The next occult holiday that we shall be examining is Easter. Now, of course, everyone knows the story that somehow the Easter Bunny delivers Easter eggs throughout the world, and for the Christian, this is supposed to be the day of the year in which Christ died. Oh my goodness, we just never seem to get these things right. I mean, I know we just finished Christmas and um, examining the time of Christ's birth, now we're going to have to examine the time when he died and everything else in between. You see, Easter itself goes all the way back to the days of Nimrod and his mother Semiramis. 
Now here's one of the most ancient of all statues that we still have left of Nimrod. Um, and for those of you who wants to do a real um, scriptural in-depth analysis of this, especially you know, from an academic perspective, in the scriptures, Nimrod is also identified, we believe, as Sargon the First. So um, keep that in mind if you really want to take a good look into the life of Nimrod. And, I said, and as I said before, his mother was Semiramis. Now, after Nimrod had been um, put to death by his uncle for starting witchcraft to begin with, his mother, Semiramis, took the whole religion and moved it underground. Well, she was a smart cookie about it. You know, this way, at least, um, for now, she'd be protected. Now, according to the stories, the ancient stories from the Babylonian Talmud and other sources, um, and these are still taught in the occult world to this very day, one day, um, after Semiramis had died, a huge multicolored egg had fallen out of the heavens and landed in the Euphrates River. The egg washed ashore onto a pile of wicker reeds, and out of this egg and her newly reincarnated form was Semiramis as the goddess Easter. Now, a lot of people think it's pronounced Ishtar, I-S-H-T-A-R. People check the Babylonian Talmud once again, it is properly pronounced to this very day, Easter. And, accordingly, as the story goes, whoever found um, Semiramis' egg first, they would receive a blessing from the goddess. Okay? This is a story of how Queen, Rem Queen Semiramis came back in her reincarnated form as Easter. Remember, her son, Nimrod, had come back in the form of Tammuz through the act of reincarnation. And she supposedly had the power to do the same thing. Remember, her son was not just a king, but he was a god. Ergo, she was a queen, and since she was the mother of him, she had to have been a goddess. This is, I know it sounds a little silly, but this is how it kind of came about. But anyways, so we now have the resurrection of Easter, Semiramis into Easter, who is now known also, occultically speak, speaking, as the spring goddess. Now, it was at the same time that the Tower of Babylon, if you remember that huge spiraling ziggurat construction that almost reached into the, into the heavens itself, had been built, and that there was many temples there. Um, on top of the ziggurat itself would have been the grandest, the most elaborate of all temples, and that would have been the Temple of Moloch. Now, Moloch was depicted as a huge, brazen, um, demonic being with um, two horns. Some had them with just one horn. And he would have his arms stretched out over a fire pit, and that fire would be going day and night. So those hands were glowing red hot all the time. Now, um, during this time of the season, once it had been established that Queen Semiramis had come back in the form of Easter and that she is also the spring goddess, well, the temple priests and priestesses had come up with a huge festival and celebration in honor of their goddess. Some of the things that they would do, they would um, actually get new robes and new headgear to wear for the ceremony. It, off, it showed that they were um, sacrificing the old for something new and that they were honoring their goddess by presenting their best. They would bring flowers and candies as offerings um, to, um, to offer up to their goddess and that the ladies themselves, were, as I said before, would be wearing um, new headgear that actually looked very similar to baby bonnets that we use to this very day. And then, of course, be this huge procession. The priest would um, lead the parade. The high priest, of course, would be in front, you know. Um, the priestess is behind. There'd be a lot of dancing, singing, and music, and so on and so forth. Now, if we take a look at this ancient 
um, statue, and again, these are very ancient. I mean, there's hardly anything like these things left, but this is the ancient god Easter. You will notice at the top of her head is the crescent moon. Remember, the most ancient symbol for Semiramis is the crescent moon. This is simply her as Easter come back as a spring goddess now. She is a fertility goddess. This is supposed to be Semiramis reincarnated. Now, another symbol we need to take a look at is what's known as the Ishtar Gate. It is believed that in front, that in front of the very ancient city of Babylon itself, the, um, the one that was really rebuilt and reconstructed um, by Nebuchadnezzar, this is supposed to be the, um, a, re a perfect reconstruction of um, the, um, the Ishtar Gate or the Easter Gate, because this was built in honor of the goddess Easter. And if you remember, the sacred animal totem for the sun of Easter, and it's on this wall, is the sacred cow, the calf. And it was the same cow or calf that the children of Israel, when they backslid, once they left Egypt, was worshiping at the bottom of the mountain of Sinai. And as I pointed out before, um, the sacred egg of Easter has been depicted in many different forms. Two of the most ancient depictographs, one here is the sacred egg of Heliopolis, which um, the egg story passed into Egypt after it had left Babylon. And this is supposed to be if we go to, um, that would be 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 4 to 5, um, the egg of Astarte. Astarte was just another cultural name for Easter. But this is supposed to be her sacred egg. And notice that there's a calf right there with her. Okay? When we take a look, 1 Kings, chapter 11, yeah, chapter 11, picking it up in verse 4 and verse 5, it says, For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect before the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Astaroth is just another variation of the name of Astarte. So you see, even as wise as Solomon was, when he got old and he just didn't have what he used to, he backslid because he, at this point, combining his wives and concubines, there was more than a thousand of them. I mean, they was just constantly telling him, you know, we'd like to worship our gods, we want you to worship with us, blah, 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 and you know, the guy was just too old to put up a fight. He was worn down. Anyways, so I think it's very easy to see where we get Easter from because when we take a look at this, well, we have all types of Christmas, excuse me, all type of Easter things going on to this very day, don't we? You know? We have, for instance, Easter baskets. You know, this one really makes me upset because dead center, we take a good look, well, there's supposed to be the cross of Calvary there. Well, guess what? Easter has absolutely zero, zilch, nada, nothing to do with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. You know, I once asked a Catholic priest, well, how do you explain the, um, the chicken egg and the rabbit? He says, well, you have to understand, as the um, chicken egg um, is in the, um, resides in the ground, 
and comes out, you know, and gives life to the chicken, so does, you know, the resurrection give life to Christ. Uh, well, I still didn't get an answer on the bunny rabbit. I, I think you just missed that one, but that's what I got out of it. Anyways, just to review some of this. The reason, first of all, there is a rabbit in this story is because, remember, um, Easter, or Semiramis, is considered to be a fertility goddess. Now, if you look at any of the ancient statues of her, such as this one right here, this one, as a matter of fact, happens to be another cultural statue of Semiramis. This one is Diana of Ephesus. You'll notice that she is a many-breasted um, goddess here. The reason? Because she is a fertility goddess. That's why, um, symbolically speaking, they chose the egg to represent her because the bunny is the fastest procreating creature on God's earth. I mean, you look at the poor thing and it's delivering more rabbits and more rabbits just like that. That's why the bunny was chosen for the Easter story because it represented, symbolically speaking, the fertility goddess. In this case, this would be Diana. But of course, they're um, counterculturally speaking, there's others. As I said, Semiramis, she'd be known as Easter, Estate, Osteroth, um, Diana, and so on and so forth. And the Easter bunny is um, quite an interesting um, fellow in and, in and of itself because with this particular picture that I have, I could not resist bringing this one. I mean, but the poor bunny looks as shocked as I am about Barack Obama. Because at this point, if you notice, I did not say president because I don't even know if the guy is legal or not. As far as I know, he's illegal. But that's another story in itself. I mean, but this poor pres um, Easter bunny looks about as shocked about it as I do. <laughs> now, of course, there would be... Um, <clears throat> Um, Easter, egg and Easter eggs in this story. Remember, it was that huge multicolored egg that fell out of the heavens and landed in the Euphrates River, washed onto a pile of Easter, um, a pile, on, on a pile of wicker reeds, and out of it came Semiramis. Now this is where we got the Easter basket from, which was from these wicker reeds. The um, Easter eggs that we have nowadays came um, from the multicolored um, egg of um, Semiramis or Easter. Take a look at this egg. This egg, um, which um, was made in Belgium back in 2005, is 2,645 pounds of chocolate. What a waste of good chocolate. I mean, people, I'm going to tell you right now, and I blame this on my mother, there wasn't a chocolate I've met in this life that I didn't like. I mean, this should have just been delivered to my home, God forgive me. But, um, yeah, if you can believe, it is ridiculous how far this is going. We have an Easter egg now that weighs 2,000. 645 pounds. And of course, you know, there are other candies and such, you know, because it's part of the sacrifice and offering we give to Easter. Remember, the ancient practice was to take candies, sweetbreads, flowers, and bring them, you know, to the temple and use them as offerings. And at the top of the temple, if you recall, was the god Moloch. Look at how this poor infant child is cradled in his arms. What it does not show is the fire and such that was consuming that poor little child in an absolute agonizing, torturous death. This is who, you know, these people among others were worshiping at the Tower of Babylon. And if you check the Bible very carefully, God tells us not to allow our sons or daughters to pass through the fire. This is what it was talking about. We are not supposed to, you see, because it's, um, if the children were babies or infants, they would be put on the hands of Moloch. 
But if they weren't, they would be thrown into the fire pit. And if they could walk through it and get out alive, um, they couldn't be touched. This is what the Bible was talking about when it said, do not allow your sons or daughters to pass through the fire. And this was done in one particular area um, known as the Valley of Hinnom. And this, if you look over here, to the left-hand side would be, you know, where the Wailing Wall is. But from this area all the way over is the ancient area known as the Valley of Hinnom. And this is where um, the practice of uh, making one's sons or daughters pass through the fire to honor Moloch was going on. Now, according to um, myth, it's, a wonderful, it's, an, it's an interesting little myth, you know. I won't get into it right now, but the ancient um, founder of Athens was supposed to have been Cecrops. Okay? Cecrops would have founded Athens right around 1500 BC. Now, in um, Athens and other cities of um, the ancient world, they would be celebrating and having these huge festivals and parades going down the streets um, honoring the gods and such. And during this time of the year, when it was time to honor um, Easter, um, among other sacrifices and things that they brought to honor her, we call, and we will find this in the Bible, believe it or not, hot cross buns. Now, let's face it, these things, oh my goodness, folks, you just give those to me hot and warm, I'll put a ton of butter on them and, you know, prove to you why I can clog my arteries faster than anyone else alive. Uh, but the thing is, you see, these things you can find actually mentioned in the Bible as far as, you know, um, the hot cross buns and what came, how they came about. Now, if we go over to Jeremiah chapter 7, and picking it up in verse 17 through 20, I want you to listen very carefully to what it says here. Because, you see, this was actually a family affair. To create these offerings, to offer them up to the goddess, was a family affair. It says, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they, that they may provoke me to answer. And it goes on and go on, but, you know, look this up, folks. Um, because, you see, when you look up um, the Hebrew word for cakes, the word is, the word is um, kevan, okay? And it literally does mean um, buns. It really um, is directly referring to this type of small um, baked buns or small baked breads. This is exactly what it's talking about. Check the word out. It's kevan. And um, bring it up. Let's see. Jeremiah chapter 44. Let's go over here. Verse 19, it says... And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Verse 25. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven, son of Amos, um, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, ye shall surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. This is who the goddess they were talking about was, and this is what they were doing constantly throughout the Bible. You will find when they're talking about the Queen of Heaven, they're making these cake offerings and other cake offerings and who knows what else. But this is what they were referring to. These are the kavan or the hot cross buns that we um, make nowadays to honor um, um, the goddess. I know that we don't do it for that reason, but that's exactly what we are doing. And if you recall, as I said before, 
There was um, the new priestesses um, would actually make bonnets for their heads. And um, this, believe it or not, it looks just like a baby's bonnet, doesn't it? And um, this here is an Easter bonnet. It's something very similar that the new priestesses would be given on Easter when they were um, getting all their new clothes and robes and such and headgear to honor at the top of the Tower of Bab Babylon um, Easter. And this would be uh, very similar to the bonnets that they did wear. Now, the big question I've always tried to ask people, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, I know it's traditional, but when you look at the truth of it, I mean, people, let's face it, this is exactly what the Bible wants about. This is nothing but occult practice. And you see, in Ezekiel, and I'm going to show you one, one last thing, well, I've got a couple of other things, but let's go over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, it explains to us that Ezekiel was petitioning God for the sake of Israel, for his people, because they seemed to be under God's punishment or under God's curse for some reason, and Ezekiel didn't know why. So God took e Ezekiel and was bringing him to various places throughout Israel and such, and at this point, they are in front of the gate, in front of God's temple it's himself now. And this is what it says. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Nimrod was supposed to have come back through the act of reincarnation as Tammuz. Now Tammuz, when he was 40 years old, was killed by a wild boar when he was out hunting. For um, this is where, in this verse, for the first time, you will find reference to what we now call, at least the Catholics practice, and call Lent. You see, Lent is 40 days in, period, in, in, in its period. Every single one of those days is supposed to represent one of the years of the life in Tammuz. There was 40 years in his life, so there was 40 days of Lent. Ladies um, were weeping and wailing over the death of Tammuz. They weren't eating, they were fasting, they were giving things up. Well, this is what they do in Lent to this very day. And right after Lent, well, we celebrate the Easter um, banquet. We have an Easter banquet where the traditional meal is still a ham. Well, Symbolically speaking, by eating the ham, you're eating and killing the boar that killed the, um, the god Tammuz. That's why you have this. It's a ridiculous belief, but believe it or not, it goes on to this very day. Now, let's um, go over here to John chapter 20, verse 1. We're about to wrap this up. And I'm going to ask you a question before I start reading it. We have, well, I don't have it, but a lot of Christians and, I'm, and even Catholics practice sunrise services. Now, supposedly, as tradition tells us, um, um, Christ was supposed to rise you know, from the grave as the sun was rising over the horizon and all this type of stuff. That's why they have sunrise services, you know? Well, makes, it makes common sense. That is, until we find out the truth of the Bible. Did Christ resurrect at sunrise or as there was light out? Let's see what John chapter 20 verse 1 says. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, Unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Guess what, folks? It was dark outside. 
The Bible does not say light. It does not say sunrise. It does not say noonday. It says it was dark outside. And I think God knows the difference since he created the, um, the, the, the day and the night. The reason we believe that it was sun, we have these sunrise services, or at least those people who practice it, is because Easter, the goddess Easter, was supposed to have come back during the rising of the sun. And when the sun had risen up, supposedly her egg had fallen to the Euphrates River. And according to the custom, after the priests and priestesses and all the followers were done at the Tower of Babylon, they would all disperse out throughout the entire land to try to find the sacred egg of Easter so they could receive a blessing. Oh, and by the way, this is where you got the Easter egg hunt from. That's how it happened. But trust me, that sunrise service only came about because of Easter, the goddess Easter, because it wasn't Christ. Here it clearly said when it was yet dark. John chapter 20, verse 1. This is another one of those paganized holidays which the Illuminati was able to candy coat and Christianize and thrust it onto us and we accepted it. I mean, come on folks. We're supposed to be born again children of God. We're the ones who are supposed to know better. And the scripture makes it very clear so much of these practices that had happened then still going on and we ourselves allow it for once ladies and gentlemen please let's stop the paganization of christianity and by doing so we can stop the paganization going on in america because i'll guarantee you right now if we don't the scriptural prophecies pertaining to the occult taking over the whole world is going to happen faster than anyone here can imagine Mark my words, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't get rid of this occult perversion out of your life, you are never going to truly be able to be blessed as a born-again child of the king. On the Illuminati's calendar, the highest the most sacred of all nights of human sacrifice is that of Samhain. Now the nights of Samhain are observed from October 29th through the 31st. Um, October 29th is the first day of Samhain and the second, third, um, second day of um, Samhain and it wraps up on what you would call Halloween, the third night of Samhain. Now Samhain is the Celtic Lord of the Dead. He is depicted as um, a stag god he always has been depicted as a stag god. Um, this is just um, how they practice in the occult. Now, this is one of the very few remaining um, reliefs of the stag god that is still out in the open for anyone to see. Um, this is, of course, this one is in the British Isles. And this one in particular, this would be the stag god, but he's also known as Kernanos. Okay, that's the Celt one of the Celtic names for Samhain. Now, one of the statues of Samhain is, as I said, depicted as a stag god. You notice the antlers and everything. Now, the stag god of the occult world, as has already been pointed out, is nothing else but Nimrod. Nimrod um, was eventually depicted as a god that had one horn, like Moloch, some depicted him as having um, antlers like um, this stag here. This is just one of those ancient representations of the stag god. Now, during the Knights of Samhain, and the Knights of Samhain came about because of an ancient um, nomadic people known as the Celts. Now, the Celtic people um, came into the British Isles and throughout Ireland, Scotland, that entire region, around 900 BC, 
and basically held all sway and authority in those regions till up and around 900 AD. So almost 2,000 years there, they were in control of that region of the world. Now, the Celtic people, these warrior nomadic people, had a priestly class like just any other major culture you can think of. Their priestly class was known as the Druids. Now from the Gaelic, Druid means men of oak. This is why the oak tree is still the most sacred tree in the Illuminati world. And it is the same oak that you will find the Illuminati owl at the Bohemian Grove is made out of. That is a 40 foot oak Illuminati owl. Now, the Druids literally held all sway and authority in the Celtic tribe. Because they were priests, they were um, exempt from um, going to war. But part of their duties of um, being a priest was they were supposed to read the entrails of animals and tell you if it was a good time to go to war or if it was a bad time to go to war. They also had um, the authority to tell people when they could get married and who could get married. They could um, tell you if a person was and should be allowed to hold some type of officer or some type of authoritarian position within the tribe. They could tell you who could and who could not be allowed to worship at their temples. Now, one of the most ancient of temples that still in exists today is that of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a megalithic stone circle. It was at places like these that the Druids would go and worship their um, stag god. Now this, this happened eight times a year on the major Sabbaths and the minor ones. Stonehenge is difficult to date. Um, the archaeologists, as far as, as far as they understand right now, it probably dates back to somewhere around 3000 BC and was built in three consecutive building orders. You know, first it was a smaller part, and they built it out, and they built it out again. Now, Stonehenge is made out of a rare blue granite material that can only be found, um, I think it's about 70-something miles away in Scotland. And the problem is, how did they get something that weighed over four tons, some are even up to 10 tons, I believe, how did they move something that heavy all that distance over the river and over the grounds to where it resides now? Now, of course, there's various myths and legends, you know, in my country, one in particular that says um, the most powerful wizard in history, Merlin, actually summoned, you know, those great megalithic stones and, you know, made Stonehenge. Well, it's a fanciful tale, but that's all it is. The one interesting thing about Stonehenge, aside from the fact that it's not just a temple complex, it's also an astrological observatory, and it's also the place where the Druids practiced the rites of human sacrifice eight times a year. Archaeologists have already unearthed underneath Stonehenge more than 4,000 human skeletal remains. Now Stonehenge, believe it or not, is a small stone circle. There were literally, there, um, you know, there were hundreds throughout that region and one of the biggest ones and part of it still exists today for people to look at is the one in Avesbury. The one in Avesbury is more than a mile in circumference. Now if Stonehenge is a small one you can only imagine how many bodies, human sacrifices, the m remains must be under Avesbury. But anyways, on the nights of Samhain, Druids would gather at um, Stonehenge and they had previously um, taken um, gourds or um, turnips. In America, we use pumpkins and hollowed them out and they would fill them up with human fat. This fat had been gathered from previous human sacrifice offerings to the various pagan gods of the Druids. Now, 
they would take um, these items, set them aside, then they would take out these huge cauldrons and put them over a fire pit and they would light them. And these cauldrons were, fit, were filled with an apple-like um, substance, you know, almost like apple juice, so a mead is really the closest thing um, to it. And they would light those fires and then they would take these turnips, these gourds, in America we use pumpkins, and they would go wandering out throughout the countryside to various homes of nobility such as dukes, marquises, to um, they'd visit this castle, this manor, and they would literally walk up to these doors and bang on them and scream out trick or treat. For those inside the home, this literally sent a wave of absolute terror throughout their bodies because if the Lord of the Manor cooperated with the Druids and gave them a treat, they would take one of their own household servants, and if they had no servants, they would use one of their own household members, one of their families, and give them over to those Druid priests so that they could be used as a human sacrifice offering that night. Now, as a reward for the um, treat, the um, druids um, would leave one of those pumpkins that had been previously filled with fat on the front door and light it. This was supposed to protect everyone inside of that house, that mansion, that manor, from all the demonic forces that they would be summoning up during the Nights of Samhain. Now here's the trick. If you did not cooperate with the Druids and give someone over for a human sacrifice offering, they would paint a six-pointed star in blood with a circle around it on the door. This is the foulest, most evil of all symbols in the occult world. There's nothing that can even come close. You need this symbol to literally call up a demon into this plane of existence. This is known as a hexagram. It's a six-pointed star with a circle around it. Usually that night, someone would be driven um, to, to their death from fear of everything that would be summoning up. They would be being attacked by demons, having these visions and everything. They would literally be driven to their own death through fear. Now, after many hours of wandering about through the countrysides, the Druids would come back to places such as Stonehenge, and this is where they would um, begin to have their version of fun. They would take um, their um, sacrifices, their soon-to-be human sacrifices, and they would line them up in um, one straight line. Now, do you remember those huge cauldrons we were speaking about? It would be cauldrons such as these, these huge cauldrons that had been previously filled up with um, that apple cider or mead-like substance, and the druids would take apples and throw them into these cauldrons. Now, I want you to think of something first before I continue. The boiling point of a liquid in this case is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Literally speaking, um, it, it, it could melt the flesh right off of you. And so what the druids would be doing, they would be taking apples and throwing it into those cauldrons. Then they would take one of those people and bring them up to the cauldron and say, now if you can take Though one of those apples out in between your teeth, on the first try, we will let you go. Now, think about this. How many of you would actually take the opportunity to try to grab one of those apples in between your teeth so that you could leave alive? Well, at first, most people would say, sure, I would do it. But you have to remember also, that cauldron has been boiling away for hours and hours and hours. It has reached the um, boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. It could literally melt the flesh off of you. Now, would you um, dip your head into that cauldron? 
And most people would say no. However, most of those poor victims back then did it. Because you see, that would be the only chance that they had of escaping and living. There was no other choice. If they wanted to have a chance to live and go back to their families, they would take it. Of course, the problem would be, once they dip their heads into that liquid, I mean, oh my goodness, the, medically speaking, from my medical background, I can tell you the damage was horrific, you know. Not just the third degree burns and the scarring alone that would happen afterwards, but the 212 degrees liquid um, brought, uh, going into the ears would give them permanent hearing loss into their mouths, they would have respiratory damage for the rest of their days. If any went um, in between the eyelids, they'd end up blind or near blind. I mean, the, the horror of what the Druids considered to be a game is, is reprehensible in the least. But for those who actually grabbed an apple, the Druids cut their binds off immediately and sent them home. However, if you did not grab an apple, in between your teeth on the first try, they threw you on the ground and beheaded you right there on the spot. And the archaeologists have found many of those remains of those people underneath Stonehenge had indeed been beheaded. Now, before the Druids had set out on their nightly vigils for those three days to um, practice and worship um, during the Nights of Samhain. A week before that event, they had sent the, Cas the Celtic warriors throughout the entire regions and had them gather up thousands of wicker reeds. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen wicker used before, such as in, you know, um, wicker furniture or in baskets that was used for um, the little baskets for Easter. Um, some people in the martial arts are using wicker reeds. Wicker is a very durable um, um, substance. It, it, it bends and gives, and it really is something you can work with. Now, <clears throat> after those we reeds would be brought over, the druids had built these huge human-like effigies. I mean, they were 20, 30 feet tall, and they had cages built in them. This human effigy was known as the Wicker Man. Now, the Wicker Man, as I said before, resembled that of a human being, and there were various cages running throughout it where they would put animal offerings, some had food offerings, the rest of it were where they put their human sacrifice offerings. They put them inside of the Wicker Man. Then afterwards, they would um, call upon um, their god, one of their um, false gods known as Kurnanos. And one thing I, I forgot to mention, if um, they didn't have enough room inside the wicker man to put all their human sacrifice offering, they had um, human um, cages made out of wicker where they could put the rest of it. But what would happen, you know, the wicker man would eventually be engulfed in flames. And this is where and what would happen to those people who was offered up as a human sacrifice on the nights of Samhain. This was their eventual fate. And what troubles me, troubles me greatly today, is that in the Nevada desert, since um, the year 2000, an annual event has been going on. It's known as um, the Burning Man. It's still the Wicker Man. What they are doing, ladies and gentlemen, these pagans from across the nation are coming together once a year on particular dates and setting up the old occult practices. One of those practices is that of the Wicker Man. Now, no one, gratefully, has been offered up as a human sacrifice offering, at least not to my knowledge. But um, it's, it really gives me cause for great concern that um, these events are going on. Um, right here, as we're saying, um, this is from the New York Times. This is, um, I believe, September 17th. This is the year 2000. 
in which the revival of the burning man or the wicked man has begun. You will notice uh, all it is, it's the same practice, it's just, you know, a different rendition of that human effigy. And yes, it does give me cause for concern. Because among other things, at where these people are gathering, the ancient animal, the totem animal for Nimrod, the golden cow, has also been reconstructed. This is the same creature that the Israelites had fallen down and worshipped at the bottom of the mountain of Sinai when Moses had vanished and Aaron was forced to um, um, make a golden cow for the people to worship. During the Nights of Samhain, even to this very day, the belief is that the veils that separate the spiritual world from the physical world are at their thinnest and that they can, um, during these days, these nights, um, departed souls can come and visit their loved ones. Now, this is only done once you like the great bonfires, or what's known as the bale fires. Once these bale fires are lit, they act as a beacon to those departed souls in the spiritual realm for them to focus on. This will allow them to cross over and enter into our world. But the problem here is no one and nothing says that these spirits that are crossing over are going to be benevolent or good spirits. Nothing guarantees that. So what the Druids came up with, um, they first um, would devise these headgear and masks that was absolutely horrifying. You know, they looked like demonic creatures and they painted these symbols and other things on their robes. And all these things were supposed to keep those um, malevolent or bad spirits in check. And of course, you know, we have um, those things nowadays. You know, this is of course where the origin of the Halloween costume um, comes into play. <clears throat> Halloween is nothing but the recreation of the worship of Samhain, the Celtic Lord of the Dead, on his high and holy days. When we take a look at Halloween for what it is, well, kids are dressed up in these costumes, so are grown-ups. They go out trick-or-treating, don't they? And they demand a sacrifice. They get candy for it. Afterwards, well, they go home and there will be these huge festivals like the Druids were doing and they will be playing the same game except we call it bobbing for apples instead of, you know, throwing it into a cauldron that's boiling at 212 degrees, we'll put it into a cauldron or into some other that or something with cold water and have the people dip their heads in it and get it that way. It's the same thing though. And so the practice of bobbin for apples still continue on today, except in a much easier format, if you would. But these things are still going on. Some people will say, oh, well, none of this really goes on anymore and that it's harmless and all this. Well, you see, this one photo that I brought is a photo of Stonehenge. Now, what most people don't realize is that this Stonehenge is in um, an area of Washington State known as Mary Hill. This, believe it or not, had been built back in the 1900s, the early past, to honor those people who died during World War I because they fought in Europe. Well, personally speaking, I don't think I would want that as my own memorial because it's nothing but the ancient reconstruction of a site where human sacrifice had been practiced. To this very day, Christians will try to counterfeit Halloween by having what's known as harvest festivals. This is absolutely reprehensible. 
the, um, all we're doing is just giving it another name because people are still bringing carved jack-o'-lanterns. They're still giving out um, trick-or-treats, candies, and other things. They're still playing um, bobbin for apples. And I know of many of those places and Christian churches now that are still having um, Christmas, um, excuse me, um, Halloween parties at the churches where people come in in these costumes. I know, I've seen it myself. We have got to make a decision one way or the other, my brothers and sisters. It's time we call it a halt to all this and say either I'm going to serve Jesus Christ all the way and that doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake or that you're not going to sin. It doesn't mean you end up perfect. But what it does mean is you're going to finally get out there and do something for the Lord or you're just going to stay on this side and do nothing. Remember, the third chapter of the book of Revelation talks about the Laodicean church age where most of the Christians will not be able to use, be, be used of God because they're lukewarm. They are literally fence walkings. They will not commit to the left or to the right. They are lukewarm. God cannot use them. They are no good to him. So if you want to be used of God, you want to claim you want God's blessing, you claim you're a child of God, then you better do something while we still can because I guarantee you right now, it is coming close to the end of history. It's coming close to where the Antichrist is going to arrive and that there is indeed going to be great tribulation upon the face of the earth. And it is up to you right now to decide one way or the other. Are you going to choose God one way or the other, or are you just going to get out of the way of those who will? Because I tell you right now, history, as I just stated, is coming to a close, and it is going to be up to you to make a decision one way or the other. Do you stay on the sand, st um, sidelines, or do you, as a Christian, a born-again, sold-out servant of God, make a stand? The next occult holiday that we're going to look at is called Valentine's Day. Now what could be so wrong about having a day set aside for lovers, people who want to send hearts and flowers and candies to people they love and care about? Well, once you understand the origins of Valentine's Day, I think you'll think twice about this holiday. Remember, traditionally it is celebrated on February 14th, which is 13 days away from the human night sacrifice known as Imbolg. Now during this time, in the early parts, Valentine's Day was um, basically to honor the first family of the occult. And that was Semiramis, Temuz, and of course the reincarnation of Temuz, I mean of Nimrod known as Temuz. Now this is um, the infamous statue known as the Venus de Milo. Okay? Venus um, was a fertility goddess. She was also um, depicted as a moon goddess. This is one of the many depictions of Semiramis just in a different culture. It's, it's as I said before, nothing about the occult had changed, and nothing about the practice. The only thing that changed were the names because of the different cultures and their language. Now, the son, if you remember, of Semiramis was Temuz, but he has now become Cupid. Cupid, as you can see, you know, uh, according to these stories, was a cute little cherub boy who would go around shooting arrows at people and making them fall in love. Okay? And the father and the husband here would have been Jupiter. Jupiter was a god of the sky and thunder. He was supposed to be the head honcho. And of course, you know, this was, would have been the Roman version of Zeus. Um, Venus would have been the Roman version of, you know, um, Hera. And as we go along, you're going to find out that um, Cupid also had a um, counterpart. 
Now this here would be um, the ancient um, picture of Venus and Amor. Amor is, of course, where we kept the word love from. But this would be Venus and her son Amor. But counterculturally now, Cupid became identified with Eros. Eros is the Greek, one of the Greek words, I should say, for love. You will notice this cherub, his wings are formed in the shape of a heart. And this is where part of the belief um, of Valentine Day comes from, because remember, Valentine Day is supposed to be for lovers. It was always believed that the seat of everyone's emotions lied in their hearts. So, the heart was the target of love, and that's why this um, Eros here, that is why his wings are in the shape of a heart, because it is supposed to be the seat of all emotions, and this was supposed to be the area, the um, human heart, that he could affect with his arrows. And of course, you know, here's one of those cute little drawings we find of um, Valentine's Day. Now, if you were a faithful follower during um, what we now call Valentine's Day, you would go to the temples, just like the ones in um, Babylon during this time of the year, and you would offer up um, candies or sweet pastries or spring flowers. And it had to be spring flowers if you were going to bring flowers because the goddess who has um, been asleep in the earth now, once the stag god took over in our, um, during the Nights of Samhain, once he took over, the spring goddess uh, basically went into the earth and hibernated. And now, during this time of the year, she's beginning to reawaken. She's coming back. And so, one of the um, offerings you would bring her was spring flowers, if you could find them. And this basically is where you get Valentine's Day for. Yeah, you may believe it's a simple enough um, day in which we honor lovers and all this, but as you can see, it's really nothing more than an honoring of the first family of the occult world, that being Nimrod, Semiramis, and Temos. All we're doing is honoring and practicing um, the, um, the cycle of the wheel of life to where Semiramis is coming back, and we're offering all these wonderful gifts to her. This has nothing to do, ladies and gentlemen, with um, anything that is good and moral. This is nothing but a sick, twisted practice that's been going on in, in the occult world for more than 5,000 years. And it's really up to us, you know, as Christians, to make, a, to make a stand, to make a choice to say, I am not going to practice this anymore. This is not godly. This is not biblical. This has nothing to do with God. It's straight from the occult world. Now, if we're to tell everyone we're Christians, then it's time we start acting like them. And it's time we start taking practices like Valentine's Day and start practicing them. Stop growing your children, you know, to believe in these things. You need to stop doing these things. You need to just stop sending out those cards and everything. You need to just stop it, period. The next night of human sacrifice we must um, consider is the night of Imbolg. Now, coincidentally enough, or maybe not coincidentally enough, we have another holiday, if you would, going on at the same time. And it is known as Groundhog's Day. Now, what could possibly be so harmful about having, you know, a furry, cuddly, cute little creature and having a holiday about it? What could possibly be so harmful about it? Well, on the surface, absolutely nothing. However, when we get into it and take a look at it for what it is, then it will become quite obvious that there's a lot wrong with it. You see, during this part of the year, um, this um, goddess has already gone into the earth. You see, the belief is, during the nights of Samhain, Halloween, 
the stag god takes over the rulership of the earth for the next six months. On May 1st, the night of Beltian, the goddess comes back in her full glory and she rules the earth for the next six months. Now, before May 1st, there's going to be signs of her reawakening, you know, or, res or reincarnation. And this begins slowly um, during February 1st during, um, or 2nd, um, during the night of Gimbog or what we call Groundhog's Day. And she will slowly come back on March 21st as the spring goddess. She'll come back as a spring goddess. Um, May 1st, she comes back in her full glory as um, the mature mother. And then when she enters into the earth, she leaves as the old crone. It is the three phases of the goddess. She comes back as a young maiden, then she comes back as a full goddess, and she goes back as, you know, the old crone and stays there for six months. Now, as the seasons are changing, um, the, co the um, weather, as you well know, is going to be changing with it. So by February, it's, you know, people are getting antsy. They're trying to determine, well, are we going to have a short winter or a long winter? Well, the common thing um, it seems to do is to grab a groundhog, hold him up into the sky, and see if his shadow is going to land on the ground. Well, if his shadow is on the ground, I believe it's um, going to be a shorter winter. If he, if he um, doesn't see his shadow, it's supposed to be a longer winter. To me, it doesn't matter. But for some reason, we are taking a little fur ball, holding it up, and thinking that we could divine the future from it. Now this is absolute codswallop, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even know how they came up with this one, but it's ridiculous. But it has a lot to do with the occult, and I'll explain why. The Earth Mother, as I said before, she is in a state of hibernation right now in the earth because of the colder weather. The groundhog himself at this stage is also in a state of hibernation. The earth mother is obviously an earth creature. Well, the um, groundhog is also an earth creature. And we, and we go through this, the goddess herself is, re is reawakening and coming back during the springtime. The groundhog is also doing the same thing. He sleeps during the winter and he's coming back during the springtime. And this happens because the goddess herself enters into the state of hibernation during the winter season. And this is what the groundhog is also doing. He goes back into the earth and hibernates during um, the winter season. The Earth Goddess is between two seasons. She's in, she um, hibernates in between the winter and the springtime. And this is exactly what the groundhog is also doing. He's going in between two times. He starts his hibernation once winter begins, and he will begin to come out of it during spring. And the Earth Goddess represents um, renewal and rebirth. And this is exactly what the groundhog also represents. He brings back the renewal and the rebirth of spring itself. You see, you can't separate the occult from Groundhog's Day, no matter how hard you try. You see, according to this wonderful picture here, the practice of grabbing a groundhog and holding him up in the air and trying to divine the future is done through this little creature known as Punxsutawney Phil. Now, there's an inner circle of 13 people, 13 mind you, all dressed in black, who um, is responsible for the care and maintenance of this little creature and for making the proclamation that it is time for Punxsutawney Phil, that is this little creature's name, and that they are going to, of course, go through the ceremony of holding this poor little creature in the air and seeing if they're divining the future. Um, well, I have to tell you, 
Out of curiosity, I had to find out how accurate Punk's Tony Phil was. He's only, um, ever since this practice began, I believe it's been a little bit more than a century now, he's only been accurate a little bit more than 30% of the time. And that's it. So, um, yeah, we are now looking forward every year to grabbing a groundhog, holding him up to the heaven, and trying to figure out if it's going to be a long or short um, season. I think the long and short of it is that people have finally lost their reasoning. I think they're becoming absolute mad. I think they're becoming barking loons here. I mean, something has to be terribly wrong when you actually think you can hold up um, a woodland creature, a cute, furry little thing, and divine the future from them. But what I think is interesting and very diabolic is how the Illuminati was able to integrate and create Groundhog's Day, put everything about um, the becoming birth of the spring goddess and mesh them together to where you could not tell that the practice of um, Groundhog's Day was as dangerous as it is. I mean, come on, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we just go up here, realize this is wrong, and call a halt to it once and for all. Because when we think we can actually hold an animal up and divine the future, something's wrong. But when we take a look at it for what it is and realize it is nothing more than another occult holiday and another Sabbath, we must stop this practice once and for all. It is on May 1st where the second highest night of all the eight nights of human sacrifice, known as Beltane, is begun. On May 1st, we also have another holiday, which we call May Day. Now, May Day is based on the belief that um, the Earth Mother has now come back in all her full glory. Commonly referred to as Gaia, She's depicted here in the center, holding her infant children again. Gaia is supposed to be the Earth Mother. She has come back after hibernating in the Earth for six months, going through the nights of Imbolg, which if you remember is Groundhog's Day. She has also passed through the spring equinox, which is on March 21st, where she was beginning to come back as the spring goddess. And now she is in her full glory, her full mature glory as Gaia, the Earth Mother. Now, one of the many depictions of Gaia is also through um, the goddess known as Aphrodite. Aphrodite was also an Earth Goddess Mother, if you would, or Earth Mother Goddess. And it was during this time of the year that... Um, she would come back in a full glory. Now, according to customs and practices, on um, April 30th, which is also known in the occult world um, as Wolpergeschnacht, great bail fires, or what you call bonfires nowadays, would be lit. Bail fires would, was the original term because they would be worshiping Baal. These great bonfires would be lit so that the Earth Mother would be welcomed back in all her glory on May 1st. And it's also these bale fires to which human sacrifice offerings had been made unto the Earth Goddess. Now, part of the practice of May Day is that usually a 10-foot pole is erected in the ground and colored ribbons are streaming down. This practice, as you could well guess, is known as the Maypole Dance, or, you know, the May Dance. You will notice that um, there is um, a boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl going all the way around. And the boys are supposed to dance in one direction, while the ladies are supposed to dance in the counterclock direction. And they dance in between and around each other, so that these ribbons slowly tie themselves together all the way down the maypole. Now, this is nothing but a fertility dance that goes back into the occult world. You see, the maypole itself represents the male phallic symbol, and they dance in this circle, which represents the female reproductive organs, 
and by intertwining the ribbons themselves, this shows the act of procreation. That's all this dance is, is a dance to honor the fertility goddess and all her glory, Mother Gaia. Now, throughout this day, it was believed that there was these little fairy creatures, and they were called fairy creatures. They're not, you know, the little Tinkerbell, sweet little things that Disney and the others try to push off on us. They were bad little mischievous creatures who would roam throughout the countryside on Beltane and give everyone grief. So, in order to keep these creatures under control, <coughs> excuse me, white hawthorn was used. White hawthorn would be tied on in ladies' hair. Some would um, tie them on the um, tie them around the um, front doors and the back doors and windows of their homes. And um, but it was believed white hawthorn and the sound of bells would drive these evil little creatures away. Now the practice, and it still goes on to this very day, that there is a May Queen and a May King. This May Queen is nothing but the Queen of the Earth, Gaia, or if we take it all the way back to the origin, Queen Semiramis. And, and I love these old photos, um, you will see this young lady here has been crowned as the May Queen, and over here would be the young man who was crowned the May King. And there would be, usually back then, a huge parade, and they would be touted down Main Street, and this, again, was supposed to be a harmless practice, but you were actually honoring the, um, the spring god, well, I should say, the Earth Mother Goddess, and her consort, her son, Nimrod. And one of the last, um, um, what they used to do, and I remember this, a lot of them, the earth goddess, would actually be put in these little niches or temple-like areas where they were supposed to remain for the whole day because they were supposed to be um, representing the earth goddess and um, because of this representation, that country or that county was supposed to receive her blessings so long as this young lady would remain there for the day. And so, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, this again is just another perversion of an occult Sabbath or occult holiday that's been going on for thousands of years. And this particular one is known as May Day. May Day has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. And I personally hope that Christians don't have anything to do with this particular day, but in the occult world, the um, spiral dance um, of the maypole still goes on to this very day. As I said before, Gaia is supposed to be a fertility goddess. And so these perverted occult practices are still going on to this very day. What we're going to do about them, well, I've chosen to take a stand at, um, against them. I've chosen never to practice them. I won't have anything to even do with birthdays, quite honestly, because birthdays are something that sprang straight out of the occult. You see, and, and you'll find something interesting in the Bible about this also, because you see, it is believed in the occult world that the highest day of existence for any practicing occultist is their birthday, because their god, Lucifer, gave them life. Now, it's interesting that in the Bible, there's only two times when someone's birthday is mentioned, and both people were practicing pagans. Not one of them was Christian, they were only pagans. So, you see, birthdays also came from the occult world. It's, I should know, it, I was part of um, the Illuminati for 20 years. I was a seventh generation witch. My family goes all the way back to 1789 in this. But the one thing I won't do now is have anything to do with the occult, especially since I'm a born-again Christian. I've made my decisions, I've made my stand. I'm going to obey God to the best of my ability. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. I still sin. I do the best I can. But I certainly can put my foot down on some sort of cultic and say no, because I did not leave 
one occult world only to enter into another. No. <clears throat> I left the occult world so I could become a born-again child of the king and stay like that. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what you need to be doing, getting rid of all this stuff and being a child of the king. The last occult holiday that we're going to look at right now is St. Patrick's Day. Now, who wouldn't want to be Irish for a day, according to what people are telling us? And what could possibly be wrong with anything about St. Patrick's Day? No, well, there's a lot wrong with it. You see, according to the story, St. Patrick was a Catholic priest who came over to Ireland. And um, one version of the story tells us that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland by some um, miracle of God, which is why supposedly there's no serpents in Ireland to this very day. The reality states that he was a Catholic priest who did try to bring Christianity over to Scotland, Ireland, and to England, and he is venerated as a saint to this very day because of him trying to convert people over to Catholicism. Now, the practice of St. Patrick's Day, among other things, involves a mischievous, evil creature known as a leprechaun. Now, we have, once again, thanks to the Illuminati, um, given the leprechaun a nice, a nice cutesy little feel to him. We'll see him as, you know, Lucky the Leprechaun on Unlucky Charms, or we'll see him on um, different shows where he's a cute little creature and all this. Well, when I was trying to find a, you know, um, a picture, if you would, that depicts leprechauns for what they really are, I came across one on the internet. And um, leprechauns, if you go by the actual stories, not you know, the candy-coated ones, was a demonic, imp-like creature that could wreak havoc everywhere he went. And there was nothing that told me exactly what this picture was when I found it, but if I'm correct, this is a picture or a still frame from the movie entitled The Leprechaun. I'm not exactly certain, but I'll tell you right now, this is the best depictation I've ever seen of a leprechaun to this very day because it represents him as the foul, evil, demonic creature that everyone in Europe knows him to be. Now, legends tell us that the power of a leprechaun resided in a magic rod or staff that he had known as a shillelagh. And these are variations of the shillelagh. It is also a perversion of Aaron's rod, because Aaron's rod, remember, had all these um, different miraculous powers that God endowed it with. And it is from Aaron's rod through counterculture that you get the shillelagh. Now, one of the most important things you need to know about that is that, if you recall, um, at the top of the spiraling ziggurat, known as the Tower of Babylon. This over here would be the actual hanging gardens of Babylon, according to the famous painting. There was a statue of the god Nimrod, um, sometimes with one horn, sometimes with two horns. And he would be um, taking sacrifices into himself in the fires. This particular um, demon, as I says, was known as Moloch. Another one of the various pictures of Moloch will show him, as I said before, once again, this one has two horns. Now, in, this, um, in 2 Kings 23.10, and we need to take a look at this very quickly, that was 2 Kings 23.10, it says, And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the ch children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch. Now, we have already discussed this before, ladies and gentlemen, but it's important for you to understand this creature here, who is supposed to be a representation of Nimrod, demanded human sacrifice. 
and that was usually young children to be thrown into um, a fire pit or placed onto his brazen hands that was over a fire pit. In, in either case, it was a horrible death. These children were literally made to pass through the fire, as the Bible says. And this practice was so well known and unfortunately practiced that one area in particular became known, and that was the Valley of Hinnom. And this is what it is talked about when it, when it says, do not make your children to pass through the fire. Now, Remember, the reason parents did this was supposed to, they were supposed to receive financial blessings from Moloch. They would receive, you know, his blessings and they'd go up and they'd make money somehow. Now, there was a practice that goes on to this very day um, in which people wear one of those horns and it comes in various sizes and shapes. And most of us have seen it before. Usually, it's in one of these forms. This is the one over here on this side is the most commonly depicted one. It's in gold. These are um, commonly referred to as the, um, the Italian horn. Um, but what they are, in actuality, they are the horns of Moloch. Each one of them, this one is in the shape of an antler. Um, each one of these comes from the belief of receiving financial blessings for Moloch, and this one in particular with the gold is the most commonly used one. And if you ask any Italian, and I've known many in this life, and I've asked them, oh, why are you wearing that? They said, oh, I'm going to be receiving money and all this. Okay, fine. You know? It is also from Moloch that we also get the um, one horn myth behind um, the unicorn. This is supposed to be um, one of the examples of a unicorn's horn. It spirals just like the spiraling ziggurat of um, the Tower of Babylon. And you were also supposed to receive blessings from this horn as a result of being, able, of being able to acquire one, if you ever could, just like the Italian horn. This is where you get the, um, eventually the um, shillelaghs for the leprechauns. Now, according to the myth of the leprechaun, there was always a rainbow somewhere. You would see these magnificent rainbows in the sky. They were absolutely breathtaking. And at the end of the rainbow, at the very end of one, there was supposed to be an item that you could find. Now, if you could find this item, among other things, um, the leprechaun would do anything to find it back. This item, in particular, was um, a cauldron or a pot filled with gold. This cauldron that's filled with gold is the financial blessings that Moloch had promised you would get if you worshipped him by offering up one of your children as a sacrifice to him. And this pot of gold is also, you know, um, referred to as a cauldron because that's exactly what it is. It's a cauldron. And if you remember, it was these cauldrons, among other things, where human sacrifice had been practiced, where bobbin for apples had been practiced, where many other things in the occult mythologies and practices to this very day had occurred. So you see, there really is nothing um, about the practice of um, St. Patrick's Day that I want to be involved in. The fact of the matter is, when it comes to any of these occult holidays, I want nothing to do with them. Because that's exactly what they are. In fact, there is nothing I want to do with any of these holidays. The Illuminati has once again managed to blindside us with their smoke screens, that being the holidays in this case. Through comparison and through looking through the Word of God, we have found that we have again been deceived because we just didn't see this one coming. We can see the pattern, the numerical pattern that was used to put the eight nights of human sacrifice together 
And we also saw the patterns of the 13s to which these holidays had been lined up. Through personal experience, I can tell you right now, we need to stop this. We cannot serve two masters. The Bible says we are supposed to be part of the world, but we are not supposed to necessarily live in the world. I should say we're supposed to live in it, but not be part of it. And that's the problem. We want to have it both ways. We want to have two masters. We want to um, have our cake and eat it too. Let's say no to the occult, but let's say yes to these candy-coated, Christianized version of the same Sabbath. When I see that all these things are coming together again, as they had back in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. Quite frankly, these things trouble me and sometimes they scare me. I know what the prophecies in the book of Daniel, in Ezekiel, in Joel, Revelation, what they're telling us. And quite honestly, I didn't think I'd be alive to see all these things coming about, but they are coming about. The prophecies are being fulfilled. It's really up to you. I can't force anyone to give up any of their holidays. I can't. Even if I could, I wouldn't do it. Because I'd be breaking one of the um, rules of God that he wouldn't dare break. I mean, he's given us each free will. And he's never stepped on anyone's free will either. This is something that we make our decisions, our choices by. And by those decisions, we will either answer to God for them or God will bless us. That's what it comes down to. You know, you're either going to be blessed of God or you're going to be reprimanded by God. And in this case, especially with these occult holidays that have been revised, candy-coated and put before before us and Americanized, those who practice it, they have an awful lot to answer to God for. Scripture um, tells us that um, there are those people who made decisions. They said, as for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. And that is the same with me. These holidays have absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. I don't care how you candy coat it. I don't care how you come up with excuses for it. I don't care how you try to say, well, the Bible really doesn't say that. Well, trust me, I've been at this. Um, I'm trying to understand the Word of God for 30 years. When it comes to the occult practices, I've got 20 years on my side. So I've been at this literally for 50 years of my life. I think I have a pretty good handle of what's going on in the occult world um, when God says it through his world, through his word and what I see out there. I think I've got a pretty good handle on it by now. And so I want to make a earnest and honest plea to each and every single one of my brothers and sisters out there. You want to be blessed of God, you want to be used of God, then you've got to get rid of these things that are not godly. I've heard more excuses for holding on to these things than, I, than what I know um, what to do. I know of um, um, one ministry in particular and others that will say, well, Christmas is Easter, they are my Lord's holidays. I will practice them. <laughs> well, the back Bible makes it very clear that those are not God's holidays. They will try to come up with the excuses why they are. The reason they do that is because ministries like that literally are fleecing the flock of God rather than feeding the flock of God. They're interested in picking these people's purses because Christmas and Easter, those are the um, two biggest holidays in existence. That's what brings in the big bucks. And these ministries, they don't want to be honest. They want to take the money um, and reap it when it's the greatest times, and that is Christmas and Easter. And they say, well, those are the Lord's holidays. Well, gee, isn't that a coincidence then? No, it's not. They're not interested in feeding the flock of God at that point. All they want to do is fleece them. And that in itself is terrible. So, it really is up to you. 
again, I wish I could get everyone to stop this so that we could correct the mistakes we've done and just honor God. But I can't force you, and as I says, I wouldn't to. It comes down to you. Do you want to stand for God? Do you want to do things this way? And do you want to be honored and used of God? If your answer is yes, put all things aside. Because to do otherwise, you're just insulting God. And that's what it comes down to. You may not realize that. You may not believe it. But as I said before, I've been doing this for 50 years. I know what the occult world is all about. I know how strong the deceit is. I know how beautiful the side of evil is. And I know that the Bible warns us that if we weren't careful, even the very elect of God could be deceived. It's up to you. Make your choice. Either stand with God or stand against God. Stay in, stay in practice, you know, these ungodly practices or become a godly person as God, wants the, as God wants all of us to be. In short, it's all up to you. If you want to get a hold of me, if you need help, contact through me through Cutting Edge Ministry. They will be able to tell you how you can get a hold of me, okay? Aside from that, all I can do is pray you make the right decision. And in that note, let me just say, God be with you. Thank you so very much for listening to this, the second DVD in this DVD series known as The Secrets of the Illuminati. Lord willing, I will see you soon on tape three, which is um, called Frontman of the Illuminati. God keep you and God go with each and every single one of you.